First, could you repeat the questions from the microphone? Sure. My question is a repeat of what I asked Mr. Lee Baker, and that is, when you went through the temple, and uh, Satan said, quick, run and hide your naked, and the narrator says, you now run and remain naked, did it ever uh, strike you that you were obeying Satan? And secondly, did, did it ever, um, what did the green apron mean to you? Thanks, Aaron. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so when I, was, when I went through the temple and I was told by Satan, when Adam and Eve take the, well, I still have some respect for the temple, so I mean, that's a thing, but anyway, I'll try to cover that. Um, Satan does tell, look, you're naked, go hide. And, uh, and, I, and so they put on their apron and uh, it covers them up. And he also wears an apron. And, you know, I didn't, uh, I actually still want to, now I'll never get a chance, but somebody told me that there are Masonic um, emblems, symbols on his apron. They're, they aren't on ours, the audience. Ours are fig leaves, but, uh, you know, fam I've heard others say this too, family sitting there, everybody's doing it, your great aunt, your grandma, They've been through this many, 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 many times. You just say, you know, I don't understand it, but I'm, I'm going with it. I'll, I'll eventually understand it when I need to. You, you're trying so hard to listen to everything and memorize everything so that you can pass by the angels with these symbols and all this kind of stuff. I never even, ever even entered my mind that Satan was doing the ordering. That's how silly that is. I wasn't actually, did you? You know, I, I, it wasn't like, okay, see, he's just, a, I mean, he's not commanding them, but he's advising them, which is kind of strange, isn't it, that we would, <laughs> that he would even be there in the first place. That always bothered me that, that he was even represented there, and he has these strange discussions with God um, in the temple, but yeah. Is it commonly taught in the wards that Jesus was in fact married? Is it taught that Jesus was in fact married? You know, in, in a normal, no. No, in fact, I, I, I probably, uh, no, I, wouldn't, I would say no. When dealing with non-members, when you were a member, and just the whole idea of deification, that you would become a god, did that ever strike you as having to tell it, or if you ever did tell it to someone else, is just strange? blasphemous or weird or something that not just with Christians but the, the, the culture at large just is like to be. Was it weird to ever discuss the fact that we could become gods? Is that basically your question? Up, yeah. yeah it's part of the logic. We lived with God before, we lived with Him forever and there was a final, somewhere we came along and said, you know, God, we want to be like you. You have a body, you have a, I guess we have a lot of wives, and we want to be like you. So how do we do that? And that, that's when the earth's created, we're given bodies, we come down here, and we go through that process to become a God, to become like our Father in Heaven. So no, that was logical. Satan was our brother, Jesus was our brother, and... Uh, he just came forward and offered himself as a sacrifice and that kind of stuff. So yeah, it, uh, that was just very normal, the part of the logic. Yes, back there. You. <laughs> Um, well, I, oh, six. So the comment basically is, well, I'm still a member of the church, will it, uh, so that I can work from within. Once I come out, they'll know for sure. Um, and is it, am I going to do more harm than good by staying in? I will say one thing, and it's just interesting, and I, I wanted to share this actually, and I wasn't sure about time, but Carla's sister. So what's that? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, um, for those that are ready, okay. Anyway, <laughs> those are ready to go. Don't uh, okay. So Carla's sister, she has just the one sister, and she's lost her parents, so was, they're very close. And Carla's sister just went totally upset at Carla and me. We tried to share with her the details of what we found, and she just was so upset. And I'll try to remember the point I'm making here. I keep getting these Alzheimer moments. But um, so within the last few weeks, last month or two, she comes to us and says, Earl, we need to talk again. <laughs> and so she sat down, and all of a sudden, we could see that her eyes are open. She's been listen she's been thinking, praying, whatever's happened. We can't really get a still a straight answer about that. The New Testament. She started reading the New Testament. Anyway, praise God, she's been born again. Wow. And uh, <laughs> this whole this whole year has been a battle. And I just was so upset because they're so close and all of a sudden her eyes are open, and she's a new creature, just like I was and Carla was. She's new in Christ. She sees things. She can't get enough of the Bible. She's praising God, and so on and so on. And it's just, it's, a, it's such a distinct difference that you just, for those of you, I'm sure most of you have experienced it, your life is just not the same, and you can't go back. And so we praise God that uh, Carla's sister's done that. Now we're still hoping for our kids to do that. But my reason for bringing that up is because uh, the son that I have that's in a bishopric, his wife's also a return missionary, very much, very true Mormon. And they've always felt like Carla's sister was an ally and someone that was there still with them. And my son, who has been asking questions, and I think we're making a little headway there, he tells his wife one day that Carla's sister has uh, had her eyes open, or whatever he said to her. And he said to her, or he said to me, you could just see the wall go up. The difference of the concept, or the, well, not concept, but the feelings that his wife had for Carla's sister one minute was completely different than she had the next minute when she found out that she had now found Christ, or whatever words he said to her. So to answer your question, as soon as you raise the issue that you are no longer believing as they believe, the wall will go up and they will not listen. So if, I would leave that to God in your heart. If you feel like you can do some good work and witness inside the church, I and if you can sit through the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Well, it's an interesting thing, and, and it is so distinct when when a person becomes a new creature, especially out of Mormonism. Hand back, way back there, the last row. The, the gentleman, and then you. Did you ever feel um, jealousy towards Jesus Christ because God the Father chose his plan instead of... You know, somebody actually said that on, my, uh, on the, the X-Files. They actually said that they felt Jesus, they were upset that they weren't the one chosen. I guess I, I did think in my own mind, I wish I had been chosen and I would have done it. So jealous, no, but uh, I certainly didn't revere him as God. I just, uh, he was just first in line and happened to be the one got picked in the Mormon church. You know, I apologize. I, I didn't hear the first part of that. Would you? Uh, do apostates go to? Is it taught in your church that apostates go to outer darkness? Yeah. See, we don't really have an outer darkness. Uh, I'm Carla, and I are probably candidates for outer darkness now, along with those of the have been true and faithful in the church, been through the temple, taken out the covenants and the blessings, and then turned our back on it 
we're the more likely outer darkness candidates. In the, in the Mormon church, and another kind of a deceitful thing, it's just amazing how many things are so deceitful, but in the Mormon church, there really is no hell other than for sons of perdition. They have a celestial kingdom, which is the best, a terrestrial, which is kind of for a lot of people, and then the celestial is for all the bad people. But Joseph Smith said that people would die if they knew how wonderful the lowest kingdom, the celestial kingdom, was. Um, Russ. Did it ever trouble you at all when you realized that Joseph Smith was not baptized by Jesus in the scene that you have to be baptized with proper priesthood authority by someone in the Mormon church to, you know, to be a member of the one true church, but yet Joseph Smith technically wasn't baptized by John the Baptist in that, in that succession of experience, you know, as, as you learned about it. Where, where it Oliver like, Cowdery and... Yeah, it went, but it went like a different kind of a sequence of things. It didn't go from John the Baptist to Joseph, Joseph to Oliver. No, because... A problem or? No, it wasn't a problem because John the Baptist gave them the priesthood. Without, how? without, without him baptizing them? Without, without well, no, they just gave him the priesthood. And so they e could each baptize each other after that. The, the priesthood was the important part, and they were given that by jo John the Baptist. But, but aren't we, don't Mormons get the priesthood through baptism? To, you know, getting... Now they do, yeah. yeah. Oh, I see, I see yeah. what you're saying. Which came first? Yeah, I mean, why, the... why, did, why, why did Joseph have to follow the the sequence the way everybody else does. Well, interestingly enough, in the church, and I'm not defending the church at all now, but um, in the church, they were rebaptized as members of the church later. See, they were, they were cleansed for their sins, I guess, the first time, and then they became members of the church later after 1830, and the church was organized. But they did get the priesthood before they were baptized. Earl, you're a seasoned interviewer now. If you were given five minutes with Thomas Monson, what would be the first thing you would challenge him with? Well, I'd sure pray about that before I went into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God, you've given me an opportunity here that uh, that would be it would be incredible. I don't know. I I would like to know what he does know. Oh, I'm sorry. If he's got such a booming voice, you know, I just. <laughs> he's wondering if I had five minutes with President Monson, what would be the first thing I would say? And I said I would pray about that. Um, I would want to know what he knows because, you know, one of the things that, again, I always stayed in church books and stuff. I read this B.H. Robert book, B.H. Roberts book about the Book of Mormon and the questions that he had about linguistics and archaeology and metal and, and all the coins and the pottery and stuff that ought to be here to, to support some thousand years of a, oh my goodness, how I bought that for so long. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I, would, I would want, anyway, the B.H. Roberts thing, because he wrote a letter, and I don't know if it ever got delivered, but I know he met with a lot of the brethren, the Twelve and the First Presidency, and shared with them the concerns he had about the archaeology and so on of the Book of Mormon. And I know that there have been pro BYU professors who have left the church, historians that have left the church. I know people have sent him my 17 minutes, whether he's ever watched it or not, I don't know. But I would like to know what they really know. And what do you think about it? Because one of the funny things, Sean McCraney, after the 17 minutes, he says, you know, I always get criticism. At least five people criticize me, of course, about my weight, my hair, my presentation, and everything else. He said, I always get criticisms, though, about the show. And um, he says, I, I didn't get one, one criticism from your 17 minutes. And I still never have. No one's ever called and said, you know, Earl, those changes weren't in the Book of Mormon. That stuff about Book of Abraham or lectures of faith, all the stuff that I said, nobody's ever challenged me on that because it's, there's just nothing to challenge. You must have something to say. <laughs> Actually, no, I've been asked to come up here. Thank you. Oh, for um, questions. So I'm here, but I want. Well, I wanted questions. you to tell him about the historian that you met with. Oh. 
Yeah, I did meet with the church. In fact, w before that, we also met with a, um, a, a friend that's an institute director. We met with him for three weeks in a row and asked him about the Book of Mormon, about the first vision in the Book of Abraham. And he added nothing to what I knew. It was, again, nothing that he could really say. And I mean, it had been the way it was. Anyway, so I also had an opportunity to meet with a church historian and talk to him. And his comment was that I know this stuff and I put it on a shelf. He said, I know. I said, but when you bear your testimony, these people, they may not have studied, but they assume you have and they know you have a testimony and so when you say something they're uh, they're relying on what you've studied and what you your faith and your conviction and he said i know what i'm supposed to say and i know what they want to hear and i thought when i left there i've met a few hypocrites in my life and i'm probably a big one myself which i didn't know before i was a sinner i that was one of the bad things about becoming a Christian. I found out I was a sinner. <laughs> uh, I need to tell you. But, but just a second. But the his. <laughs> but the historian. But the historian. When I left there, I I've never felt quite like my goodness. What what must God think of a person who can actually look at black and call it white? You know, I just really, that really bothered me. I just wanted to say that Earl was a very humble LDS person. I know, I mean, we were proud in the sense we thought we had the truth, and we wanted everybody else to have it too, but Earl was not a prideful Mormon, and he feels now like he was, but uh, we were just trying to do our best, but one of his big things in his life has always been to tell the truth and not to be a hypocrite, and I think that played a big part in his leaving, and um, this uh, church historian pretty much yeah, was, might have been, well, I think Earl was past that, but he was definitely the, if he wasn't the nail in the coffin, he was all the dirt. <laughs> Thanks, dear. Anything else? Uh, yeah. As one son of perdition to another, first I want to thank you for being here today. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, being so public with your testimony, one thing I wanted to ask you, though, was how, after being in for so many years, how much anger did you have towards the mm -hmm. church? And how you dealt with that? And how you. Like a lot of that's almost become an atheist. Yeah. He's asking about our leaving the church, are we angry? And because um, a lot of people that do leave become agnostic or atheist. Again, I give credit to Sean for that. I, I don't know, I, I can't always say, I didn't always think of myself as being a spiritual person, but I guess I was. I always trusted in God. I, I do regret the tithing a little bit. <laughs> Uh, but we also gave that willingly and, uh, uh, you know, that was just what we did. But uh, I don't know. I think uh, I, I wasn't angry. I, I, the, the, the biggest concern, I, I guess I felt betrayed and disappointed. I felt that I, I obviously wished I had raised my children differently. And um, I do think here in Utah especially... And I know some of you have come from back east and you probably have feel a different culture here. When we, if and when, and pray we do get when, the LDS start leaving in mass groups, the, the, the churches here are going to have to accommodate that. And they're going to have to realize that these people are coming from structure. They've been told what to do. They have a certain sense of that. and. And it's going to impact on pastors, and it probably has in groups already where more and more former LDS come in. They're going to have certain expectations, perhaps. But I think it could be quite a cultural shock, both for those coming out and even for the Christian community to accept um, all this movement in the church. So thank you very much. We appreciate your participation.